Psalm 145, verse 5, 6, and 7 says, On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Is there more to being in awe of God than our focus and our fellowship with Him? I mean, how did others come to see God so wonderfully throughout the Bible? It's simple. They followed Him. We are back to our Restored Wonders series. We're in John chapter 1. This is the third message in this series where we've been talking about restored wonder, restoring wonder. And that title implies a couple of things. One, it implies that we were once in awe of God. And another thing it implies is that we are currently not in awe of God right now. So that may be you. Uh, This series may be tailor-fitted for where you're at right now that you can remember and think back on a time when you just were totally amazed by God, but somehow, some way, over the course of time, uh, your fervor has cooled off, and you're not seeing God in the way that you had seen Him before, and you're wondering and you're questioning. I know COVID took a lot of things from a lot of people, um, but now it's time to get something back, and I think this season is a great time for us to be able to look at the Bible to see what the Bible teaches us about being able to have this incredible encounter with God as a result of our life, of a lifestyle. The very first message in the series, we followed Moses up onto the mount where he saw the burning bush. And it was burning but not consumed. And he said, I must turn aside and see this thing of why the bush is burning but yet not consumed. And it was when he turned is when God spoke to him and laid that call on his life to go back into Egypt to be a deliverer to God's people. Next, we spoke about fellowship. It was not just focus and the things that we should be focusing on because God has never changed. He's always been awesome and amazing. And if we're not seeing it, it's not because He's stopped being that. So we focused. The second thing was to fellowship. We, were, we looked at the fact that we're not called to just know with a head knowledge of God and be able to answer all of the Sunday school questions right, but we need to have an experiential knowledge of Jesus one that is where we are walking with Him, we are fellowshipping with Him, we are spending time learning about Him in the Word. It is a knowledge that is a result of an ongoing, deepening experience with Christ. That causes us to be in wonder as well. And this morning we move from focusing and fellowshipping now to following. And be reminded this morning in this passage that there are things that we get to see And behold, that leave us in awe and wonder about Christ in ways that others don't because we're serving Him. We're walking with Him. We're following Him. We're walking in obedience to Him. We're submitting to His Spirit. There are things you're going to see on the field in ministry that you won't always get to see standing on the sidelines. The Gospel of John chapter 1 It's incredible, I think, that John begins this gospel much different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospels as the synoptic gospels, and John's is different. doesn't follow the same pattern. John portrays Christ differently in some ways than the other three. And John begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word. Now, don't get me wrong, most all of the gospels deal with Jesus' beginning to some degree. But John says that in the beginning was the Word. And John is saying that Jesus Christ is literally the Word of God in flesh, the Word incarnate. And if you think about it, speaking that Jesus is the Word of God in flesh, I want you to notice what Jesus' first recorded words are in the Gospel of John. You'll find it in verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? I love that. The Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This John 
is recording that Jesus' first words were when some disciples of John were following him, and he turns around to them and he says, what are you seeking? What a great question for us today. I mean, really, what a great question for us as we're considering our own relationship with the Lord. As we're considering, looking and considering the awesomeness and the greatness of God. Ask ourselves that question, what are we seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. I think it's interesting that we saw in verse 38, Jesus getting their attention. Asking them to verbalize what they're after. What's your goal? What's your dream? What, what are you wanting? Or your focus? And the second thing he says, the second thing he's recorded is saying, come and you'll see. We see focus. We see fellowship. And now in verse 43 through 51, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let me stop there. This story this morning, just this little short verses from verse 43 to 51, may really tell your story. I mean, you may have, as you're thinking about your life in, in relationship to this verse, and you may be able to hit some of these high points. You may be able to say, you know what, someone who trusted Christ as their Savior came to me and invited me to come and see Jesus and be saved myself. Some of you may say it was an invitation to an impact weekend or an invitation to a mission trip or an invitation to church. Some of you may say it was just an invitation over to somebody's house who had a deep love for Jesus Christ. And from that, you were saved because you trusted Him yourself. Some of you may also say, you know what, this has been an incredible journey. From that moment I first believed, I've been walking with Him, and, and along this journey I've seen God do some incredible things. I may not have seen heaven open and angels ascending and descending on the Son of God, but I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen God work in the lives of others. I've seen God work in my own life. I've seen God work in me, through me, and for me. So some of you may be able to relate to this verse, this story. Some of you may not. Some of you may not have ever had somebody who truly loved Jesus and was, was so excited about Him, and they, as a result of that excitement, as a result of their own personal experience with Jesus, that they invited you to come and to meet Him yourself. You may not have had anybody like that. You may not have had anybody that, that ever shared with you the way to know God through Jesus, the way to be saved. You may not have ever seen God do really incredible things. And you may even be here this morning saying, you know what, I've heard about Him doing great things. I've read about Him doing great things and others, but I haven't really ever seen anything myself. That's maybe what you say. So some may be able to relate, some may not. But I want you to consider for a moment, who is this guy that Jesus is speaking to? John refers to him as Nathaniel. And he's not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Only John. And John's Gospel mentions him twice. One in chapter 1 and one in chapter 21. In chapter 1, we have right here his call. He comes to Jesus as a result of Philip saying, come and see, uh, we have found the Messiah. And he comes and he believes and makes this great profession. 
And we believe follows Jesus because it's at the end of the Gospel of John that we find this Nathaniel in the boat with some of the other disciples, including Peter, and they're fishing after the resurrection of Jesus. So we ask ourselves, and there's some question of, is this Nathaniel actually a disciple of Jesus? Is he indeed one of the twelve? And even though there, not everybody agrees on this, most, I think, would safely say that we believe this is one of the twelve disciples, that Nathaniel was actually the disciple listed in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as Bartholomew for several reasons. One is, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the Synoptic Gospels, when you find Bartholomew, he is attached closely in the list to Philip. We find here, Philip is the one that brings Nathanael to Jesus. Secondly, we find this same Nathanael in John chapter 21, at the end of the story, being with the twelve, or some of the twelve that Jesus hand chose. And finally, the name Bartholomew actually means the son of Timaeus. And what that means is that he may have actually had another name besides the one that means I am the son of my father, Timaeus. I believe, and for the sake of this morning's message, with that evidence, with those thoughts in mind, I think it's safe for us to say that this Nathaniel we see in John in chapter 1 and verse 21 is one that was handpicked by Jesus who was also called Bartholomew. Why does all of this matter? Because this wasn't just a man he met on the road. This was a man that committed his life to following Jesus. Jesus wasn't a pastime, wasn't a hobby for this guy. No, not at all. This was a guy who sold out his life for Jesus. Historical accounts of Bartholomew state that his martyrdom, we don't have any evidence of this in Scripture. But the best historical words that we get regarding how this Nathaniel died was that he was skinned alive for his faith in Christ. This is not just somebody he met on the street. This isn't just somebody who made some kind of offhanded comment. This wasn't someone who got caught away with the words of his mouth and didn't have a life that followed. No, this was a guy that believed all the days of his life. I want you to see three things this morning. The first is this, is that Nathaniel was brought to Christ. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I guess you could say when I read that, I read that kind of boring. It wasn't intentional, that's just me. I wasn't doing it for effect. But I want you to consider something this morning. I want you to consider the message that Philip had. I want you to think for just a moment. I want you to take yourself out of 2021 and you will say amen. <laughs> take yourself for a moment out of 2021 and put yourself right there at about AD 30 in Israel. It's been over 400 years silent. I say that. Thirty years prior, they heard the birth of Jesus Christ. The shepherds and the wise men. We know the story. The glory of the Lord began to show. And then now the message was coming. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So there's starting to be something now. And now Philip, who had previously encountered John the Baptist, has heard John, this way maker, this, this guy who's preparing. They've seen this man who's really unlike anything else. Anybody else. I mean, it's like they took the Old Testament prophets, you know, and picked them up and replanted Elijah right here in the New Testament. That's what it's like. I mean, they see John the Baptist walking around in his camel hair clothes, eating locusts and honey. I mean, this guy is straight from the Old Testament, okay? And he's the one who's preparing the way for the Messiah. So this is something new. I mean, this guy is caught drawing crowds. People are coming out. He's preaching with boldness against the religious leaders. He's, seeing, he's baptizing people left and right. And all the while, he's seeing Jesus. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was quick to point out that he was not the Messiah, but the Messiah was coming. So in Philip's time, they have been looking and waiting for the Messiah. 
They knew he was going to come. They didn't know when. And now they see John the Baptist who's preparing the way for the Messiah. They have John the Baptist on record saying, that's him right there. And Philip finds him. Guys, you, we can't really understand and wrap our mind around how big that news is. I mean, that is the biggest news that not just on a national level that they have found the King of the Jews, they have found the Son of God. They found the One that Moses spoke of that was revealed in the Law and the Prophets. They found Isaiah's suffering servant. They found Jeremiah's weeping servant. They have found the One to which all of the other pictures were simply that. And Philip comes with an incredible excitement. I mean, in my mind, when I play this through, I see Philip shaking. I, I see him visibly distraught over this fact that he has just seen the Messiah. I mean, he has just found the one that was prophesied. He has found the Son of God. And I believe that excitement is radiating out of him. I imagine he's stuttering. And he's trying to get the words to come out just right. And he's bouncing and he's shaking. And he comes to Nathaniel and he says, listen, we have found Jesus. We found him. And he, you know, Jesus, he's, he's the, the Joseph's son, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I won't go into all the detail, but there was great prejudice here. How does Philip respond? To Nathaniel's claim, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Philip didn't get into some big debate with Nathaniel. No, he just invited him to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. You come and experience Jesus yourself. Friends, I, don't, I hope we don't ever lose sight of this beautiful picture of someone who had a real encounter with Christ and went out and intentionally sought other people and invited them to come and experience Christ for themselves. Number one, Nathaniel was brought to Christ. God used Philip to bring Nathaniel to saving faith. Number two, Nathaniel believed in Christ. It says in verse 47, when Nathaniel, Nathaniel saw, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, he said of him, Behold, an, in, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. I love Nathaniel's response. How do you know me? Don't you think if somebody is bragging you up, you would probably have a tendency to be like, Oh, no. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I would like to think we would. Someone's like, oh, this guy, he just never lies. Wouldn't you just down in your heart feel almost embarrassed by that? And you'd be like, <laughs> stop. Not Nathaniel. Jesus says, indeed, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. What's Nathaniel say? Yeah, that's right. How did you know that, though? Guys, here's what I love about this. Jesus was able to to read Nathaniel's heart. Jesus knew things about Nathaniel that nobody else knew. Jesus knew who that man was that was coming to him before he even got to him. Jesus' knowledge of Nathaniel was not dependent on Nathaniel releasing that information. Indeed, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, who does not deceive, who is honest, who is a man of integrity, who seeks to do right. I'm sure there were times in Nathaniel's life, if I take this story, there were moments in Nathaniel's life where he could have crossed the line. I'm sure there were moments in Nathaniel's life where he could have deceived somebody to make himself appear better. There were moments, I'm sure, where his integrity was on the line and he did not yield to that temptation. And I'm sure he knew it was hard to hold on to that integrity. 
I'm sure he knew it was hard in all that was around him and all the opportunities to do what was right, but he knew in his heart, I'm going to be a man of integrity in my heart. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that there had to have been these battles. Jesus knew the content of his heart. And he says to him, Nathaniel, I know who you are. You're a man that has a good heart. And then he says, how do you know me, Lord? Listen to what Jesus says now. Before that Peter called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Jesus is not just now telling Nathaniel, I know who you are. He says, Nathaniel, I know where you were. We can take from this, we can deduce from this story because of Nathaniel's response that he is surprised that Jesus knew where he was. And we take from that to believe that Nathaniel was intentionally in a place where he did not want to be seen. He probably went under the fig tree to get some quiet contemplation on the Word of God. Maybe he removed himself from everybody else and found that place under that fig tree to be just alone with God and to pray and to worship. Maybe, just maybe, based off of the the signs given to us from this conversation, maybe Nathaniel was under the tree reading Genesis 28, the account of Jacob and the ladder and the angels ascending and descending. We don't know. But we know that that Nathaniel was in a place where nobody else would have known. And Jesus says, Nathaniel, I know you. I know who you are. And I know where you've been. What's Nathaniel's response? (laughs) Look at this, guys. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Let me just tell you, That type of declaration does not come from men easily in the Scriptures. Jesus asked His disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? We believe you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but it's been revealed to you of my Father which is in heaven. And I will say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's great profession, announcing that on behalf of everybody else, came to Jesus, in which Jesus said, that was not the response of flesh and blood, that was the response of my Father in heaven telling you that. And here Nathaniel, in the beginning... All he knows about Jesus is that Philip believes that this is the Messiah. And now he comes and Jesus says, I've read your mail, I know who you are, and I know where you were. And that's all it took for Nathaniel to say you are the Son of God. That's huge. It's enormous. Guys, let me tell you something. Never underestimate the power of Jesus to read your mail and the change that brings in your life. Never underestimate the power of the omniscience of God to change your life. Let me give you an example. In just a few chapters from this story, Jesus is going to go through Samaria where no other Jewish leader would have gone. And He goes through Samaria and about noon, He finds a woman coming out to the well to to get some water. And He knows this woman. And in talking to her, he reveals to her that he is the Son of God or that he is the Messiah. And he says this. He says, go bring your husband. She says, sir, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, ah, you've got five husbands. That's Jesus reading mail, friends. You see, for Nathaniel, here's a man with a true heart. For the Samaritan woman, this is a woman that's got some skeletons in her closet. Do you remember what that Samaritan woman said when she went back to her Samaritan, her village? This outcast woman runs to that village and says this, come see a man that told me all things ever that I did. Is not this the Christ? Never underestimate the power of the fact that Jesus knows everything about me and you. Jesus dealt with this present. He was a man with no deceit. In his heart. He dealt with his past. Nathaniel, I know 
where you were. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have a problem getting past your past? And number three, he says this to Peter, to Nathaniel. Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than these? Jesus deals with all three different areas of time. Present, past, and future. Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, you stick with me, you're going to see some incredible things. He's saying to Nathaniel, if you think this, if you think the fact that I knew you were under the tree and that I know your heart, if you think that's incredible, well, prepare to have your mind blown because you're going to see some awesome things. And Nathaniel believes it. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, we don't know what exactly he's speaking of. Is he speaking of some event that was to happen in Nathaniel's far future, on the eschatological timeline? Is he speaking about something in this new heaven and new earth? Is he speaking about when the angels came and ministered to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? We know that there were very few. The innermost disciples were there that close. Is he speaking about the baptism of Jesus when the, when the glory of the Lord was open, the heavens and the voice of the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the, the Spirit of God descended on Jesus. Right, what are we talking about? We don't know. But we know that when Jesus said it, He attached a verily, verily to it. Only found in John's Gospel. 27 times He uses verily, verily, or truly, truly, or amen and amen. And Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. Nathaniel, listen to me. True, true, these words are. You're going to see greater things than these. Number three, Nathaniel was promised by Christ. It was understood that he would follow and that he would see. It was understood that there were great things to lie in front of him. One of my great, one of my enjoyable pastimes is I enjoy reading books about missionaries and other biographies of faithful men and women throughout centuries of Christianity. And I especially love reading mostly pioneer missionaries because I love the challenges that they faced on the field of ministry. And I love to see how God oftentimes would provide special strength for them, special focus, and how God would use them and, and, and bring them to a level of commitment that even not seeing great results, they would continue to be faithful and steadfast. I love those kind of stories. I'm, I'm currently reading a book by missionary Amy Carmichael who, who ministered in India, actually southern India. And, and she was alone originally. She went, by her, or she went by herself. She wasn't married. But the book is called Things As They Are. And I want to share this with you. I referenced this a couple of weeks ago, but listen to this short quote about her writing in this book saying things as they are. She said, humdrum we have called the work. And humdrum it is. There's nothing romantic about potters except in poetry, nor is there much romance about missions except on platforms and in books. Yet though it's dull at whiles, there is joy in the doing of it. There is joy in just obeying. He said, go tell, and we are, have come, and we are telling. And we meet Him as we go and tell. Let me repeat that last part. And we meet Him as we go and tell. You see, here's one of the great things, friends, is that these awesome things that God wants to do to leave us in awe, they're not just in the things that surround us. Please, don't mistake that. God wants to work in us. He wants to transform us from the inside out. He wants to do a work right now as a result of the work of His Holy Spirit utilizing the Word of God, sometimes utilizing the people of God. He wants to bring about transformation inside of us. He wants to change us. Make us different. But He doesn't just want to work in us. He wants to work 
through us. He wants to use your life, much like he used Philip, to bring people to him. He wants you and I to be the physical extension of his body to a lost and dying world. God wants to work in us, through us, and for us. We know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28 We often think that I'm going to see God do these great things by working for me. Answering prayer. And that may be, but that's not always the case. But God does want to work through you and in you. Our future is largely dependent on our present. Who I'm going to be in five years is largely dependent on who I am now and the decisions I make. I told my kids the other night, I said, you know what, truly, my life wouldn't be anything without Jesus. It was a decision I made, oh my, a long time ago, to go to church with my friends. It was a decision I made to rededicate my life to Christ as a result of the Spirit's working on my life. It was a decision I made to go to the Baptist Student Union that night where I would later meet my wife. And from meeting my wife, who has been one of the greatest decisions in my life outside of Christ, as a result of meeting my wife, I have three kids. Let me tell you something, guys. I am who I am because of Christ. I've seen the things I've seen because of Christ. And there are things that you and I will never get to see sitting on the sidelines. How do I know that? Because I've been on the sidelines. There are things that you and I get to see when we step out, when we take God for real. When we say, God, what does your word say? I want to do your word. Hebrews chapter 11, the the chapter of faith says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's, it's, faith is a necessary ingredient for me to see Christ do something, but it's also a necessary ingredient for me to see what Christ has done. One of the greatest miracles in all the Bible, outside of the resurrection of Jesus, is when Joshua is fighting the five kings of the Amorites. And I want to end with this. The five kings of the Amorites and their armies are starting to get away. And Joshua says something. It's one of the most incredible prayers, I believe, in all of Scripture, that Joshua turns in front of all Israel and says, Son, hold your spot and moon freeze over the valley of Ajalon. Now guys, that's huge. Sun, hold still. Moon, freeze right where you are. Why? Because we need more light, right? These guys are starting to run away, and we want to wipe them out before it gets dark so they don't go to their villages. So he stands in front of everybody and says to God, God, cause the sun to hold still and moon freeze. God caused the moon to freeze, and it does. Now we know, I know some of you astrophysicists are going to tell me they don't really move. It's us that moves, but play along. It does. One side of the earth was light for an extra day. One side of the earth was dark for an extra day. That decision, that prayer, that miracle affected the whole world. But you know what happened before that? As Joshua was fighting the five kings of the Amorites and their armies, they're starting to get away. Do you know what happens? Before he says, sun, stand still, moon, hold your place, Joshua sees God throw down firing hailstones from heaven. Think about that for a minute. You're fighting these enemies. They're starting to get away. And all of a sudden, you start to see fiery hailstones fall from heaven and wipe out some of the enemies. In fact, the Scripture says God killed more with His snowballs than Joshua did with the sword. Even though everybody in the world got to experience the miracle of the sun standing still and the moon holding its place, not everybody got to see God throw down those fiery snowballs. That was only for the ones that were on the field of battle. It was only for the ones that had gotten out of the stands and come down and joined the fight. Friends, how do we see God? How can we have our wonder restored once again? It's to remember that He never changed. We have. And we need to realign our focus. We need to get back serious about fellowship with Him, not just the head knowledge, 
but a personal, experiential, ongoing knowledge of Jesus and follow him. Follow him. What does that mean for you right now? What does follow Jesus mean? Does that mean to be saved? Maybe like Nathaniel, you were invited here. You came here. Maybe you didn't even want to be here, but somebody invited you. And this morning you've heard of the greatness of Jesus. You've heard that you can have your sins forgiven. You've heard that this God who knows everything about you, loves you, died for you, and wants you to receive his free gift of salvation today. You can start that relationship new with him. You can have your sins forgiven. You can begin the first steps of following. Maybe you've never been baptized as a result of you after your salvation and you are saying today, I've never taken that first step of obedience. And today is the day I'm following Jesus in baptism. Maybe it's a rededication. Maybe you know right now there are besetting sins. There are things that are wrapping you up, tying you up and hindering you from being able to take one step after the other in following Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said, it is no credit of God to be praised by a man of no character. This morning I want to ask you, the God who knows your heart, what's He saying to your heart? What is He leading you to? Because I promise today, when you and I begin following Jesus, walking according to His Word, taking that step of faith, I promise you, you are going to see God work in you, through you, and for you. I believe greater things than these show you and I see. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings. 